let me show you a math magic trick. Here I have a cup, and I'm going to give it a 2 pi or 360 degree rotation. And now, the cup is oriented exactly how it began, but my arm is all twisted. Then, in the same direction, I'm going to twist again another 2 pi, so I've done a 4 pi rotation, the cup is again back to where it started, but my arm is now untwisted. So, something very weird is going on that a 2 pi rotation is going to twist the ambient space, but that a 4 pi rotation is going to fix it. I can do basically the same trick with my belt. I'm going to give it a pi, a 2 pi, a 3 pi, and a 4 pi rotation, so this belt is nice and twisted, and I can show you that I can actually untwist this extremely twisted belt without changing the endpoints. So if I manipulate it around a little bit, I'm going to use my other hand here to come in and let go and re-grab, but I haven't untwisted the endpoints. Nevertheless, as I pull out, it's going to be exactly flat. So I'll show you one more time. Pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and 4 pi, and then keeping the orientation of the endpoints fixed, I am going to reach underneath, but I haven't unspun anything, I managed to make it go and be exactly flat again. So, understanding that phenomenon is going to be the goal of this video, and along the way, we're going to really dive into the mathematics of rotations in three dimensions, in particular, something called the special orthogonal group. My thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video, more about them at the end. Let's start off simple, just two dimensions. I've taken an image of my math merch, and I have it spinning around. Now, I can model a rotation by just a point on a circle. That is, if you take any point on a circle, that defines some angle theta with the positive x-axis, and then I'm going to say I'm going to rotate my image here, my shirt in this case, around some point by that same angle theta. So the big idea is there is a correspondence between points on that circle and the idea of a rotation of the plane around some origin point. These are in one-to-one -one correspondence, and so when I think about rotations in two dimensions, I just think of it as choosing a point on a circle. So that's two dimensions, but three dimensions is a little bit more tricky, because if I say rotate by pi degrees, you'd say, well, rotate how, in what direction, and about what axis? Here I have my globe, and I can rotate it. It's a little bit noisy. And the point about the globe is that it's not just that it has a rotation, it has an axis of rotation, this, this bar that's going from the bottom all the way up through the top. In three dimensions, you have to tell me the axis of rotation, and then you have to tell me how much you're rotating. If we agree that this is the axis of rotation for my globe, then we can talk about a rotation by pi over 4 radians or whatever else you like. I can move this globe however you wish and spin it this way, for example. This now has a different axis of rotation. So, if I'm going to be able to describe a three-dimensional rotation mathematically, I'm going to need to describe both an axis of rotation and the angle. Let's do the axis part first. Let me consider a three-dimensional ball. I call this a ball, by the way, as opposed to a sphere to indicate that I'm including all of the points in the inside as well as that sphere on the boundary. If I take any point on this ball, I can imagine the vector that goes from the origin out through that point. That's going to give me a vector, and I am going to say that this vector is the axis of rotation for whatever the rotation is that I'm trying to describe. So, for example, with this cube, its axis of revolution is just lying along the x-axis. This point is now straight up, and it gives a different rotation of the cube, and this point is sort of off at some interesting angle, and it gives a third rotation of the cube. So the big idea is that a point on the ball is corresponding to an axis of revolution. Note that in two dimensions, we didn't have to worry about this, because if you had a plane, like a horizontal plane, the axis of revolution is implied, it's just sort of straight up. So there was no ambiguity there, we didn't have to worry about what the axis of revolution is, as we are doing here. Okay, you can have an axis of revolution, but by how much should you rotate? And this is where the real magic comes in. This ball, I haven't told you yet, has radius pi. And so what I'm going to do is use the length of the vector to tell me how much rotation should I do. I'll say I'm rotating in this direction. How much should I rotate counterclockwise looking in that direction? Well, the length of the vector. 
So for example, this vector is at the point pi zero zero. And what it corresponds to is a rotation of the cube by pi radians about that axis of revolution. In contrast, this vector, its tip is at pi divided by two, zero, and zero. It's a shorter vector. And so it still corresponds to rotation, but it corresponds to a rotation only of pi over two about the x axis. So now what I have is that every point on the ball corresponds to a particular type of rotation. But there is a problem. We have a double counting. Consider these two rotations that start with the same cube and it looks like end up at the exact same spot. The cube is oriented the exact same way after doing these two different rotations. The basic idea is if you look one way and rotate by pi or look the other way and rotate by pi, both counterclockwise in the directions you're looking, you just end up at the exact same spot. So for any rotation by pi, that is any point on that boundary of my ball of radius pi, I would be double counting to try to map those two rotations in three dimensions. And so the space that I'm going to use to model rotations is not the three-dimensional ball. It's the three-dimensional ball subject to a gluing, subject to an identification where I say, if I take two antipodes on opposite sides of the ball, those are thought of as the same thing. Now I don't have a double counting problem. Any interior point of the ball maps very nicely to a specific rotation. There's only one, so there's a, a bijective correspondence. Opposite sides or, or antipodes of the ball get glued together, so we think of them as one point mapping to one rotation. Now, let's go back to, say, this twisted belt or the twisted arm with the coffee cup. Because everything I've just talked about was talking about one rotation, a single rotation. But if I look along this belt, the idea is that the belt is rotated different amounts at different points along the belt. This is my sort of mathematical approximation or visualization of this belt. I've put a bunch of triples of vectors and each of those triple of vectors is just meant to indicate how twisted is it at that particular point along the belt. So for example, this is an entirely untwisted belt, so every one of those vectors just looks exactly the same. But if I rotate it by say pi divided by two, then I'm gonna see that at different places along the belt, that triple of vectors is rotated different amounts. Here's a rotation by pi and it just gets increasingly twisted. Okay, so where was that on my three dimensional ball? All right, so let's go back to my ball with gluing of antipodes model that I have here. Consider for example, this path that I've isolated in white. As I move along in time, the vector from the origin out to wherever I happen to be along the path is consistently changing. So basically a path in that ball is going to be kind of like my twisted belt. Note by the way that if I have a point right at the origin that just says don't do any rotations at all, and this particular path that I've come up with here, well, it has no rotation at the beginning of the path, then it rotates a lot through the middle, and then finally no rotation at the end. Kind of like I had with my belt where I always left the endpoints fixed. Let's do a few simple paths. I'm gonna model my belt as entirely along the x-axis. It's completely horizontal, but it's got different amounts of twisting. So what would be a twist by pi? Well, the path would look something like this. As time went on, our vector started at the origin, just goes down the x-axis until it hits pi. But what if I then wanted to introduce another twist and now make it a two pi rotation? Remember that looking in the positive, remember that looking in the positive x-axis and rotating by pi is glued to looking in the negative x-axis and rotating by pi, those are the same thing, they get the same rotation. So if halfway along my path, I've ended up at the point pi zero zero, I can then start moving again from the point minus pi zero zero. Those are the same point. They correspond to the same rotation. So that's what I'm gonna do from the other half. I'm gonna start at minus pi zero zero and my vector's gonna get shorter and shorter and shorter until it goes to the origin. So that is my two pi rotation has sort of two different portions going from zero out to pi zero zero on the positive x-axis and then going from minus pi zero zero to the origin along the negative x-axis. Put those together, you get a twist by two pi. A twist by four pi then is just doing that thing twice. Zero out to pi zero zero, negative pi zero zero out to the origin and then that one more time. That is a four pi twist. But the four pi twist was the special one. That was the thing that undid all of the twisting. So that is the thing I have to show you next. I'm gonna project down to two dimensions. So 
I have a circle here and I really want to think of it as just looking in the XY plane of my three dimensional ball. It turns out I do not need the Z axis to be able to illustrate this point. So for the sake of simplicity in the animation, we're just gonna go into the XY plane and see that projection. I'm also gonna color code it. So my four pi rotation has these four sections. It goes out along the positive x-axis, it comes back along the negative x-axis, it goes out along the positive x-axis again, and back along the negative x-axis. That's my 4 pi rotation. Now you'll notice that I've made them slightly curvy away in my model. Part of that is so that you can visualize it a little bit easier. But the other part is that I'm allowed to slowly manipulate what happens in the middle of my belt. It's just the endpoints that are fixed, endpoints corresponding to the origin in this case. I can't cut my belt, I can't rip it apart and put it together in a different way, but I am allowed to continuously deform the middle of the path. So that's sort of what I've done here. I've slightly separated these lines, and in fact, I'm gonna keep going. Watch this. I'm gonna smoothly move these paths away, and one point along the boundary circle always gets glued to the antipode. That's always allowed. I've never changed the endpoint. The beginning and the end of this path start at the origin exactly as you'd expect but along the middle, I really manipulated it. And I'm gonna manipulate it again. Let me first close up one of the loops. This is sort of that middle loop here. It closes up, closes up, closes up. And I can do this entirely in terms of my ball. It's just a small, continuous deformation at any given point. Then I'll do the other loop. It's gonna collapse back down to the origin. And what do I have? I have that exact same path that just stays there at the origin the entire time. Or, in other words, it's entirely untwisted along the length of my belt. That as long as I am making continuous changes along the middle, obeying the restriction along the boundary, I have this way to deform my complicated four pi twist path just into a path that's constant at the beginning. But let me just put up a two pi path. This is one that just goes out to the boundary along the positive x-axis, is glued to the negative x-axis and goes back to the origin. That was just a two pi rotation. But if I manipulate that, if I spin that around, if I twist that around, unfortunately there is nothing that I can do. There's no way to collapse it to that constant path at the origin. This is sort of the mathematical reflection of the fact that this two pi twist is, if I keep this fixed here, if I keep this endpoint fixed, there is nothing that I can do to my arm. There's no way I can manipulate it to untwist my arm. That trick only works with a four pi rotation where I come around one more time. So our big lesson learned is that a two pi rotation can end up twisting the ambient space, but that a four pi rotation can fix it. Let me show you one more example. And this time I'm going to show you it in Brilliant, which is the sponsor for today's video. Brilliant is an online learning platform and they've got an enormous number of courses, but I'm gonna look through their calculus course because you know I love calculus and check out the example called Gabriel's Horn. This is a crazy example where if you begin with the curve one over X and then I'm gonna drag the slider here to revolve it around the X axis and the resulting horn has amazingly infinite surface area, but only a finite volume. Crazy, right? But what I really love about Brilliant is that they don't just tell you things, they let you play around and get your hands dirty until you really understand and master a concept. In our case, we're gonna have to come up with formulas for surface area and volume of a surface of revolution. And they help break it down step by step so that you can see the ideas. And their materials are just peppered through with little quiz questions like this one. So you try to figure out, okay, what's the right formula? Let's see if this is gonna be correct. Darn, it's incorrect. What have I done wrong? Well, I can look at that explanation and I can read through it and figure out what I've done so I can truly master it. Everything is just like really beautifully animated, like this particular one for the cylindrical shells. And so you just get this really nice visual understanding of what's actually going on. All of this active learning is just excellent pedagogy and it's why I'm so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. So go to brilliant.org slash it, sign up for free, or the first 200 people are gonna get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So with that, if you like this video, do give it a like for the YouTube algorithm. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.